and welcome to the second episode of the Women in Law series. Today I'm joined by Dami, a trainee at Herbert Smith Freehills. Hey Dami, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Thanks for having me. Just to kick us off, uh, could you tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, maybe a little bit about what you do in your free time and your educational background? Sure, so like you mentioned, I'm a trainee solicitor at Herbert Smith Freehills. So um, I'm currently going into my fourth seat. So I did a seat in real estate, then in dispute resolution, and then I went into finance and now I'm going into my fourth seat, which will be an international secondment to the Paris Finance Office. Um, and also a bit about my background. I went to the University of Warwick and I studied law and business. And then I did the accelerated LPC at BPP University before then going straight into the training contract in 2019. Wow, all of that is really, really impressive. Um, what's been your favorite seat so far then? So I'm currently in finance. I'm going into another finance seat. So I've really enjoyed that. I've really enjoyed all my seats actually. Um, I think I'm in quite a unique position. I have an interest in transactional work and contentious work. So I've just enjoyed my whole training contract, but I think particularly finance has been a strong one for me. That's really good to hear. Um, how does the seat allocation work at HSS? So the seat allocation process works in various stages. So I haven't actually been through it yet myself. I'm going into it now. So how it usually works is that you have a form that you fill out and you get to express your preferences for which departments you'd like to go to. And then it'll depend on um, business need, which departments are taking jobs, um, taking trainees, and then it just works in that way. Okay. So I think what a lot of people want to know about is what do you do just day to day as an average trainee you know is there a lot are you given a lot of responsibility early on or so there is no average day of a trainee and I think especially during the pandemic there isn't really an average day because what my day looks like now working from home is very different to what it was like when I was physically in the office however that typical tasks you can expect to do as a trainee. So that could include things like drafting and it depends on whether you're in a contentious seat or whether you're in a transactional seat, the types of documents you will be drafting. So um, when I was in disputes, the kind of things I assisted with drafting were just things like letters and particulars of claim forms and various other forms. And because of the contentious nature of it, it goes through more levels of review. However, now I'm in a transactional seat, I draft perhaps a wider range of documents such as legal opinions, um, perhaps sections of intercreditor or facility agreements. So drafting is a key role of a trainee and quite an enjoyable part of being a trainee. And then you also have things such as research tasks where you might be looking into a point of law, perhaps it's going to feed into a claim or a defense, or perhaps it's just a standalone, a, perhaps it's just a standalone um, query that the client has asked for. And then you also have the transactional management areas of the job. So that could be having calls with the client, having calls with local counsel, um, speaking to various people. So it's a very varied job, but those are the typical types of tasks you could expect to be doing. Wow, all of that it sounds interesting. Yeah, and you are right, it's really varied. Um, you mentioned early on, you know, the pandemic. How has that been for you? Have the firm made it easier for you in any way? Or So I think the pandemic poses its own unique set of challenges. So for me personally, as a trainee, I'd never worked from home before. So that wasn't something I had experience of. So it was definitely an adjustment process, learning to work in the same places that I live in. But I think in many ways, it can also be a really good opportunity. So I've really been learning to lean into the flexibility aspect of working from home because it's cut out my commute time. It means I can start and stop in different ways that I may not have been able to do in the office. But I think one key way that I've been able to really lean into that opportunity was to try to recreate the work environment at home. So I think one of the key things you miss from working from home is just those conversations that you might have in the corridor when you're going to fill up your water bottle or um, the 
people that might pop into your office. So those just more conversational interactions with people at various levels in your department. You just don't get that working from home. So I think a key thing that's been encouraged and that I've done is just to put time in various people's calendars for catch ups, um, have video calls throughout the week. I have a call many times a week with my supervisor and I have various small group sessions. So I think trying to have all those interactions while still working from home is a really key way of mitigating the key issue which is just not being able to speak to people as much as you would be if you were in the office yeah well, that's really good and I think that's like a nice tip for everyone who's watching you know if they're struggling in the pandemic and working from home that well this is some way that you can recreate office life a little bit um, another thing that's quite topical at the moment is legal tech have you been involved in using any Yes, yeah, so that's a really interesting question because legal tech is something that a lot of people are talking about, a lot of firms are talking about it, and a lot of individuals are really wanting to get into that area. So I'm part of the legal thinking and design team at HSF, which is a group of people who help to think of new ideas, test out new things that are going on in the firm, new tools. So um, one of the key tools I've been testing out over the past year is a tool called Contract Companion, which is kind of like a add on to Word, and it helps you when you're proofreading documents. So you have all these really long agreements. So an integrator agreement could be up to 200 pages long. However, you need to really make sure that the defined terms match, the cross references match. And this can seem like a really minor point, but it's so important because you need to make sure that the document's consistent. And when you're negotiating a document, there can be various iterations of that document. So through this contract companion tool, it's just a way of streamlining the process, making it a bit faster, pointing you to areas that the tool thinks you might want to focus on. So it's a really good starting point and saves me so much time when I'm looking at documents. So that's one key tool that I've been looking at, but there are various other ones such as Contract Express, which is a, a document automation system, which helps you create contracts in a faster way. So it's not going to write the whole contract or the whole agreement. I don't think um, legal tech is going to be replacing yeah. lawyers anytime soon, but it, helps make the process faster so if you have a smaller document so i think when i was in real estate i used this a bit where you have um shorter form documents that only need to be filling in perhaps party names or um details of specific details of the transaction but they're perhaps just a couple of pages so through something like contract express you can do this a lot faster and then we also have the digital law group. So you can, as a trainee and as an associate and later on, go on secondment to the digital law group. And then they help with coding, with creating pricing tools, drafting tools. So the area of legal tech is really exciting. And I've just mentioned a few of the various things that are going on, but if you're interested in it, I think yeah. a lot of firms are really pursuing that area a lot. Yeah, I think it's fantastic you as a trainee as well that you're already getting to use it. It just shows that it's not just everyone who's high up, it's that everyone in the firm is getting to benefit. So in terms of, you know, this is a woman, uh, women in law series, what kinds of problems do you think women face in the legal sector? And is there anything you've encountered? So I think there are a wide range of issues that women do face. And I think that's just reflective of society in general. I don't think it's particularly unique to the legal sector, but just reflective of the world at large. So things such as unconscious bias and um, just a wide range of issues. But I think a key way to mitigate these issues are these initiatives that many firms set up. But for me, I think the better question is what happens on a day to day basis. So for me, it's the everyday engagement that you get with these issues and the interactions you have with people and the fact that you can realize that people do really care about the issues. So I think a, a key example of that that happened quite recently is that I'm co-chair of the Women Trainee Lawyers Network at my firm and we've been starting a podcast series talking about a wide range of issues such as balance, starting conversations, breaking barriers. So really honing in on some of these issues that women in particular face but just 
issues that a lot of people face in the world. And it's been really inspiring to hear people's stories and also really great to know that people want to have these conversations. So I mentioned the episode on the topic of balance, which went into areas of work-life balance. And I remember sending an email to a, a woman called Alison Brown, who is our managing partner of part of the firm. And I sent her an email asking, perhaps you wanted to come and speak on this podcast episode. And I think a lot of the people on my committee were thinking, I'm sure she'll say no, she must be so busy. But just the fact that she prioritized speaking on this podcast and a wide range of really busy people are prioritizing speaking on these topics, those everyday interactions are what will counteract the issues and what will lead to progression, I think. Yeah, that sounds really good. It sounds like HSS culture is really like celebrating women. And it's nice that you've been given that networking opportunity. What advice do you think you would give to women wanting to go into law, knowing what you know now? So I think I would give a wide range of different advice, depending on specific people. But the general advice I would give would just to be back would just be to back yourself. So I think a lot of people come in with a bit of a imposter syndrome perhaps, or sometimes on a day-to-day -day basis, you just lack confidence sometimes. So I think backing yourself and knowing your worth and knowing that you deserve to be in the spaces you occupy is a top tip that I would give to people when they are going through the application process. So when then the interview being confident and then when you actually get into the firm being confident to occupy the spaces you do and knowing that you deserve to be there so I think that would be my top tip. Okay that's really valuable for anyone watching and is currently doing applications especially because you've been a successful candidate you've been there and done that what do you think you know made you stand out in the application process or even the interview and how do you think maybe other people could make themselves stand out? So I think there are various things you can do. So in the application process, I think the key two things that I would encourage a lot of people to do is to really firstly research the firm. So as a rule of thumb, if you can copy and paste um, something you've written for one application in another application, it's probably too generic. And so what does this look like in practical terms? I think a lot of the things that I did was setting up alerts on Google for the firms I was applying to. So I would be getting information directly into my inbox about when a firm did whatever. And I had these alerts set up on the lawyer as well. And I would also go on Chambers to really know about the firm I'm applying to, which is really good for me um, because it meant that I only applied to the places that I felt I would be aligned with. And then it was also really good for the person reading my application and knowing that I'd actually spent the time doing that research. And then in that application, really try to convey that knowledge in a really structured way. And I'm sure you've heard this time and time again, but that star structure is super basic, but it's really important. So that's the situation, task, action, result, because it's just a really easy way of having a well-structured answer. And I think that's what they actually are looking for. So you can just get that tick, 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 just make it as easy as possible for the person reading your application to be aware of what you've done and the competencies you're trying to convey. And then when it comes to the interview process, there are many things you can do to stand out. But a key piece of advice I was given quite early on and in a completely different context was that who you are is your CV and how you make them feel are your references. Because the one thing that makes you stand out is who you are. Of course, academic ability, leadership skills, research of the firm, like I mentioned, all these other things such as commercial awareness are really important. But ultimately, what makes me stand out, I think, and what makes other people stand out is the collection of who you are as a person and how you make other people feel, especially in an interview context. So I would really advise people when they are going into an interview to have a think beforehand about who they are, what their personal brand is, and what makes them unique. Because I think when a lot of people go into interviews, they disregard a lot of the things that they do because they don't think they are legal enough. So 
perhaps you have a hobby that you spend a lot of time doing or you've had a part-time job all the way through secondary school and all the way through university or you have a charity that you're particularly passionate about or a sport that you spend a lot of time training for a lot of people disregard these things but those are the things that contribute to who you are as a person and they also make you more personable so I think really honing in on these things considering them and then really reflecting that in an interview setting is really valuable and helps you to stand out. Okay, all of that advice is brilliant. I'm sure everyone watching is really grateful for it. <laughs> um, just lastly now, if you could sum up your training experience in three words, what would they be? That's a good question. So um, I think I would say varied because the, the role of a trainee is ever-changing depending on which department you're in, um, what time of year it is, so varied definitely. I'd also say it's intense because there are high expectations, there's a bit of a steep learning curve, but then I would also say it's really rewarding because the kind of transactions, the kind of cases you're doing usually are really complex. So when you do a good job, it feels really good and you're really helping clients to achieve their aims and to being part of a solution. So that feels really rewarding. So I think those words were intense, varied and rewarding. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for speaking with us today, Dami. It's all been really helpful. Uh, we're just going to cross off now. Thank you.